Welcome to this video, uh, which is just some thoughts on designing and deploying a reflection site. Well, the first thing is to make sure your antenna is surrounded by natural planar surfaces. So typically, if you're going to try to measure water, no crashing waves, um, you know, no rough outlet glaciers if you're in polar regions. And especially for people that want to, you know, repurpose sites near harbors, it's a big problem that large ships come and go in those regions. So try to set things up where you're not going to be impacted by the kind of activity. Um, the biggest thing I want to emphasize is that you should know before you build your site whether it's going to work. Uh, we've built a reflection zone app that lets you know that if you tell the app your latitude, longitude, and the height of your antenna, we can tell you what the reflection zone is. And that could tell you, for example, to move the site closer to the water or away from certain rough features that you don't want to measure. Um, and it's really important that you do that before you install the site and build the monument. Um, I'll show you an example. So here's a site on the left where it's a, a beautiful uh, site. It's a good geodetic site. It's a nice monument. It's a good instrument, but it's simply too far from the water surface to provide a good tight gauge. I can see that just by looking at it. It's about two to two and a half meters tall. Now, I took the coordinates of this site as it was built, after it was built, and I plugged it into my um, web app, and I'm showing you the screenshot for this particular site. Um, it tells me that the antenna is about three and a half meters above the water surface, but it also tells me that we're looking this direction in that photograph. Almost all the reflection zones are either parking lots here or um, boat harbors, which, you know, this is not the way to measure tides. So that's not to say that you couldn't get some measurements, but again, um, the elevation angles here are five degrees in yellow and blue is 10 degrees. You're not even able to use five to 10 degrees. You'd probably be, my goodness, at best you'd be at five to seven degrees. So it's extremely suboptimal for any kind of meaningful reflection research. It would be very poor for tides. Um, so getting back to what I was talking about, you should run your site at a sampling interval commensurate with your target area. Uh, we have some code that tells you how to set that number. I'm going to try to port that for you, but it has been published in this reference here. In general, if you're less than 10 meters vertically from your surface, you can get away with 30 second data, but you're really constrained in how you understand what's going on there. It would be better, for example, to do 15 seconds if it was possible. Um, but I'll, I'll say more about that in a subsequent uh, video. So I would also point out that if, if you have flexibility, you know, think about the reflection zones for your latitude. So if you're in North America, don't face your GPS antenna looking out onto a northern water body and expect to get good reflections. We don't have satellites tracking in the north at most of West, uh, most of North America. Same for Southern Africa, South America, Australia. Don't face your antenna toward a water body to the south and expect to get good reflections. Um, snow accumulation, I would put it out there that where you're gonna be using a daily average, you wanna make sure your antenna is at least a, a meter above the highest snow level. So if you have any historical data that tells you what typical snow accumulation levels are, keep that in mind. You're probably gonna to have to revisit your site anyway to download the data in polar regions. But that's a sort of a rule of thumb. If you're trying to do water uh, reflections, I really think you should keep three meters at least between the water and your antenna vertically. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that unless you're doing a lake, you're gonna be doing sub daily estimates so you can do tides. And you want that extra distance to allow you to do that measurement better. So how do you operate that site? So I'll just add this on, you've built the site, always remove the elevation mask. A lot of people use elevation masks on receivers and it's completely unnecessary. 
software has elevation mass. Use the elevation in your software, not your receiver. Um, again, set the sampling er interval by what you're trying to measure. The standard sampling rate used by geodesists was set in the early 1990s. I mean, when people didn't have big disks or the internet, for goodness sake. So let's not use sampling rates that were set 30 years ago. I urge you to collect and archive more data so it can be used for more purposes, including environmental sensing. Don't degrade your data. Uh, some archives take data at many rates, but don't archive it. Uh, take photographs of your site. Many, many networks do a good job of this. Uh, it's helpful when you're trying to understand why certain things work and certain things don't. Uh, and again, this is just a, a point to the people that are um, possibly wanting to put their GNSS antenna on a roof for security reasons, for power. This all makes a lot of sense. There's no problem with that. But if you want to get reflections from it, pick the corner of the building that's going to give you the best view of the natural surfaces, because otherwise you're just measuring your roof. And there's nothing that can be done about that after the fact. Track all GPS signals. And I really encourage you to track GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou as well. I know that sometimes there's extra costs associated with that, but if it's within your budget, I almost always get asked about antennas. If you're trying to use the site for positioning as well as reflections, by all means, buy the antenna that you think is best for your positioning applications, but it's not gonna stop reflections. It doesn't matter what they're telling you, it's just not true. And then um, again, put SNR data in your Rhinex files. Some archives don't require that. And frankly, I think they should. Um, Geodesists generally include it and that's to, to our benefit. And then I encourage people to use the Rhinex 3 format if, if they can, just because it's a little friendlier to multi-GNSS uh, data tracking. So I think that's it. Thanks. I'll be talking about some new topic later.